Doctor, my eyes have seen the years and the slow parade of fears without crying. Now I want to understand. I have done all that I could to see the evil and the good without hiding. You must help me if you can, Doctor, my.
Hey everybody, this is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Uh, I'd like to dedicate this song to all the people out there who are on the front lines um, that are doing their best to get us through all of this. This song is called My Hero. And if you sing that last chorus every time you wash your hands, I think you'll be in good shape. Welcome to the June 2020 virtual quarterly meeting of the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital medical staff. Here is your medical staff president, Dr. Jim Salwitz. Good evening. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, this is a celebration this evening. It's a celebration of the remarkable success of this hospital and this campus and this staff in responding to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, remarkable people came together at remarkable times to produce an incredible result. You'll hear this evening from administrators and leaders, clinicians and academics about what happened, what they learned, how we responded, and what they see the future is going forward. Um, these are the people who are there working with all of us every time and so much a part of the soul and heart of why we succeeded uh, in this battle. 
In the last couple of years, I think many of us have had moments of time with all the change that has happened at this institution, in this system, at this medical school, well before COVID and through it, about what it is that we're building here. I think we've all had moments of confusion, perhaps doubt, of what does tomorrow look like? You know, how do we work? How do we build together? And I could tell you that the weight of history is with us. I could say we're investing $200 million in the surgical center. I could say that we're building a neuroscience building at Plum Street. We're building over a $1 billion cancer hospital across the street, or that the likely merger with St. Peter's will make us one of the largest medical centers in the United States. And together, that group, with two medical schools, with Rutgers University, with a slowly affiliating, assimilating medical system, will carry us forward to greatness. And I would be right, but I would also be wrong. What we saw through the COVID experience is what really makes this place great. We saw clinicians, academics, medical staff, hospital staff coming together, learning from each other, teaching each other, working every day, sacrificing, at the same time, learning and teaching and publishing. We showed that we are a great academic medical center. And we showed why this is a place that going forward will change the world. And we, every one of us should be proud of what we have achieved here, what you have achieved here, and what we have done upholding our professions and protecting the health of our communities. I'm excited about this evening. Uh, I think it's an interesting way of communicating with the medical staff. Um, too bad it took COVID-19 to do it because I like the idea of virtual meeting. So many of you can't come to the hospital you know, to sit down and have a meeting, and this lets you reach out uh, and listen and learn and ask questions. Um, you can get CME tonight. There'll be a link on our newsletter in the next week or two to apply for CME. You can ask questions. Use the comment or link section you know, on uh, your YouTube screen tonight. Ask questions. Please identify who you want the questions to. If you don't, we'll figure it out. But nonetheless, you know, we get to learn together tonight. Uh, there's only one downside, um, and that is uh, I don't get the opportunity to feed you. Now, I would tell you that you should just call Mr. Gantner, you know, and he'll send a pizza to each one of your houses. But I think we've all had it up to here as far as donated pizzas through this, so I'll let that one go. So uh, we start a really interesting evening, and in, I have the great honor and respect of introducing one of the true heroes here at our medical center through this entire event, um, our chief medical officer, Dr. Stan Truskin. Oh. Thank you, Jim. Uh, that was a great introduction. I have very little to add to that other than to say that throughout the surge, I was proud to be a part of this medical staff. You know, the people you're going to hear from today did an outstanding job of coordinating the care. And I think it's been one of the major highlights of my career to be, be here through that time. We did first class medicine uh, from the protocols that were developed, the multidisciplinary approach that you'll hear about uh, from Dr. Borkoff, the job that the hospitalist service did, Dr. Uh, Siddiqui helped organize. The ICU care was um, exemplary, and everybody did pull together. It was very stressful, but it was a great experience to share with the people I work with every day. And I think it brought out the best in everyone. So without wasting time at all, I'll introduce our CEO, Mr. Don Gantner. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Truskin, uh, for those remarks and for what you do for us uh, every single day as our chief medical officer. So um, I have a couple of roles here tonight. Um, I want to continue the welcome uh, that Dr. Sowerts and Dr. Truskin have begun to deliver. And I want to say thank you for all that you've done through the pandemic and what you're doing 
uh, as we're emerging from the surge and now getting back to uh, to our regular business. I would tell you that um, it was May 26th when the governor lifted the moratorium on elective procedures. Um, so for the past month or so, we have been getting back to more routine operations. And uh, again, a thank you to everyone. We're probably across the board at about 70% of our normal operating capacity. So uh, we're very pleased with the progress uh, that we make each and every day in terms of uh, getting back to a more normal state. So thank you there. Um, I wanted to mention also as part of my introductory remarks that uh, you heard Dr. Salowitz, the transaction with St. Peter's University Hospital continues to move forward. The teams continue to meet throughout the pandemic. Um, I would expect that later this year, uh, maybe sooner rather than the very end of the year, there will be a definitive agreement that's agreed to by both sides, and that will then begin the regulatory approval process. But I can tell you there's tremendous enthusiasm uh, from all parties to get that transaction done. And as was mentioned, to, to put together a roughly 1,000-bed academic medical center, uh, it's very exciting. It's probably 50 years overdue, but it seems like this time it might really happen. Uh, my other job tonight, um, happily, is to talk a little bit about, about our experience through the uh, COVID pandemic, the ups and downs of the COVID, COVID pandemic. Uh, and I have some slides to help me do that. Um, so what did we do uh, during the pandemic? We really transformed Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. We are a tertiary academic medical center with specialized services in a variety of specialties. We're the level one trauma center for the center of the state. We had to change the institution in a very short period of time and become, in effect, 75% of our capacity was available to become an isolation hospital, expanding ICU capacity, getting a vent capacity to our facility. We still needed to maintain some of those essential services that we provide as a regional referral center, such as level one trauma. We need to support the OB service because that can't wait. Um, we had oncology work that couldn't wait. Uh, we are, have a heart transplantation program that we needed to continue. So we couldn't turn into a 90 or 100% isolation hospital, but we were shooting for 400 to 450 beds available capacity to handle COVID patients. Uh, how do you do that? Two basic requirements. You need a well-developed plan dealing with space, labor, and supplies to convert the facility. And uh, very importantly, we need care teams to manage the uh, unique patient population. Um, we developed that surge plan. That really was our blueprint, our roadmap for working through the pandemic. Um, my staff color-coded it based on the census. I think they know that I'm colorblind, so that was another way to keep me out of it. But um, uh, green was our earliest stage. That's up to 10 patients. Um, maroon was the ultimate stage, 200 plus uh, patients. And we moved very rapidly uh, up through that scheme. And I'll, I'll provide some more detail on that in a minute. It's interesting when you watch, and I have a graph that'll show it, the surge in the number of patients, how steep the curve was once that uh, pathogen came into this community. So what do each of those color codes really mean? Um, I'll go through this very quickly, but green is less than 10 patients. We started planning on February 28th. We took in our first COVID patient on March 12th. By March 15th, three days later, we had a census of over 10. So we moved from the green to the yellow. Um, when we're in yellow, it goes up to about 30 patients. It took eight days to push through the yellow. You can see some of the steps that were included in our plan when we were in the yellow zone. Um, on March 24th, we moved into the orange portion of our plan. Uh, that required us to expand our ventilator capacity. Um, we also had to fine tune our transfer center uh, because we noticed that we were getting some inappropriate transfers of COVID patients uh, because some patients were, hospitals were reluctant to handle them. Um, and so we had to make sure that we uh, retained our capacity for COVID patients from the local community. Uh, we moved into the red zone uh, on March 30th, and we were only in that zone for eight days. Again, that's because the 
their uh, curve got very steep. Uh, while this disease was surging up in this community, we were doubling our inpatient capacity or inpatient uh, COVID patients about every three and a half days. And then on April 8th, we went into the highest zone that is the maroon zone, 200 plus patients. And we were there uh, for about 18 days. And that was our peak. Uh, the maximum number of patients, the highest level of patients we had was 257. But we had a census that ranged between 250 and 257 for slightly over a two-week period. And that was uh, our peak surge. This is what it looked like um, by day uh, over the course of that period. It took us 55 days to ramp up uh, to that peak surge area. And uh, since that time, we have been on the decline. And increasingly, as the curve came down, we increasingly restore portions of the hospital back into normal operations. As of this morning, there were about 34, 35 patients listed as COVID patients. However, of those patients, only 15 were still testing positive. So the other patients had recovered from COVID, but are still classified as COVID patients because that was the original diagnosis. So that's our curve. You can see much steeper on the way up than it has been on the way down. The cohort of COVID positive patients that we have in hospital today are mostly the ICU and most of the ICU patients are vented. So these are very, very sick patients. Uh, they will be with us for a while. I think we can expect to have some modest level of COVID positive patients in the hospital uh, for a while and up until the next wave, if indeed there is one. But that's our history right there with uh, COVID-19. So uh, what we did was we have done a lot of lookbacks to see what we've learned from our experience with COVID-19, recognizing that there could well be a second or even a third or fourth wave. Uh, we did an employee survey. We did a survey of the people that worked in our command center because we did, as was pointed out on some of the earlier sites, we did set up a command center, which really becomes the central nervous system for the hospital during the pandemic. Um, so we got a lot of information about what we did well and where we had an opportunity for improvement. So some of the strengths that came back were uh, the fact that as an organization, we activated our command center early. The command center was set up in the old boardroom down the hall in this administration building. We set that up well before we took the first patient in while we were still developing the plan. And we conditioned the organization to run all requests for information, all decisions through that command center. There was a lot of collaboration. And I think the urgency of the situation, the necessity for collaboration between and among departments, specialties, and agencies. And when I say agencies, that, that includes uh, the New Jersey Department of Health. As a level one trauma center, we were in, in effect appointed to be the hospital that oversaw the coordination of COVID activities among the 19 hospitals in central New Jersey. We also work closely with the governor's office in setting up um, a surge hospital, a field surge hospital at Raritan Center. Um, and I, I was on a daily call with the commissioner of health, as were the CEOs from hospitals up north, University Hospital in Cooper, down south, uh, really to act as a sounding board to allow the commissioner and her staff and the consultants that were working with the Department of Health to take some of their theories um, and perceptions and bounce them off the field. We were the field, uh, the connection to the, to the patients. Our laboratory was a big part of our successful management of COVID-19 patients. We in Hackensack were um, the first hospitals actually on the same day, both hospitals got approval to do COVID-19 testing. That was a real advantage because if you recall back, um, back then, the state was handling most of the testing. It took days or even a week or more than a week to get test results. So many of the hospitals that were at full capacity or over full capacity were holding PUIs, patients under investigation, waiting for test results. We never had a particularly large census of PUIs because we could test in-house. That turned out to be just a tremendous advantage and continues to be an advantage in managing through this pandemic. Um, and we set up an inventory system very early on to keep track of PPE in particular. That was a problem throughout. That continues to be a problem. That'll be a problem going forward. 
There are real shortages of PPE. There are some areas where we can improve, um, and I think just generally, uh, the, our, our staff, particularly the frontline healthcare workers, weren't hearing as much, getting as much information as they needed to get to keep them emotionally uh, comfortable and content. So we thought we were communicating reasonably well, but what came back was we could have done a better job. So next time around, if there is a next time, we'll make sure that some of the detailed information gets down to the front line. Um, there was a, a request for more transparency, particularly as it relates to the availability of PPE. Um, we need to develop stuff. We need to stockpile certain supplies uh, because on a couple of days, we were just a day or two away from running out of certain things. And uh, if there is the ability to stockpile, we're going to try to do it. But most of that material still is in uh, short supply. So here's some of our stats. We did about 7,700 tests for COVID patients. Uh, third bullet down, we had about 1,400 COVID positives in-house. We discharged almost 1,100 of those to date. Uh, we have 37 uh, still in-house, and we had 269 expirations. If you look at our expirations number, it's higher certainly than what we're used to seeing among our patient populations, but actually we were one of the highest performing hospitals in the state in terms of uh, mortality. So now we're on our road to recovery. We put together a reverse engineering of our original surge plan, and we're calling it our recovery plan. Uh, on the left, what we're focusing on, you can see safety, care teams, staff resilience, uh, very concerned about uh, the emotional impact on our staff, have a number of programs in place to help them deal with some of the, the trauma that they saw and lived through uh, as we surged up. And then uh, we have put together a video uh, to share with the consumer and with uh, our caregivers and partners, uh, uh, letting the world know we're reopened. So why don't we show that? And then I'll try to, we're running a little late on time and I'll try to pull it back a little. Hello, I'm John Gantner, president and CEO of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. I am pleased to let you know that Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital has resumed normal operations and services following our COVID-19 pandemic response. On behalf of our team members and medical staff, welcome back. I want you to know that our hospital has gone above and beyond all recommendations by the Centers for Disease Control and other national and regional experts to ensure that you have a safe healing experience. I also believe that it is important for you to hear directly from the people who are working hard every day to make sure that Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital is safe and ready for you. We use advanced technology to deep clean and disinfect our facility to ensure the environment is safe for you and your loved ones. After we detail clean with a powerful disinfectant, we activate an ultraviolet light emitting robot called Trudy. That's short for Total Room Ultraviolet Disinfection. We also use Dazzo Fluorescent Marking Gel to identify the presence of germs. And we use the System Sure Plus Cleaning Verification Process to measure environmental hygiene to ensure that all surfaces are properly cleaned. Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital has launched a thorough screening and testing process to create a safe environment for all patients and providers within our facility. We were the first hospital in New Jersey to offer COVID antibody and COVID PCR testing to all of our employees and physicians as part of a Rutgers study to better understand the impact on hospital workers. Temperature checks and symptom screenings are performed for all patients and staff before entering our facility. All patients who are scheduled to have surgery or invasive procedures are tested for COVID-19 at our recently opened testing area prior to their procedures. Our five-time Magnet Award winning nursing team focuses diligently on quality and safety throughout your hospital stay. We're ready to provide exceptional care for you and your loved ones. The fact is that as an academic health center, we never stop working to meet New Jersey's healthcare needs. During the peak of our surge in COVID-19 patients, our cardiac surgery team successfully performed two heart transplants 
our comprehensive stroke center team, Revive Brains, and our National Cancer Institute designated cancer program continue to care for patients. Welcome back! Welcome, Welcome back. back! Welcome back! Welcome back! Welcome back. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about uh, some of the after effects of COVID-19. We are, as I mentioned, in the midst of our recovery plan, we are doing very, very well, and we're happy about that, and we're thankful and appreciate all the contributions from the medical staff to allow us to rebound that way. At the last board meeting, which was about two weeks ago, uh, I ended my remarks to the board by discussing the fact that COVID-19 was a game changer, a game changer for the way we live our everyday lives, but also a game changer uh, in the industry of healthcare. And there are some permanent impacts from COVID-19 that we're gonna be dealing with. So I wanna share a couple of my thoughts um, right now. So the first one is kind of fun. Uh, COVID-19 is a game changer to the way we live our lives. I'm not sure. We're going to go back to shaking hands when this is all over. Not anytime soon. I'm not sure we're going to bow or do the elbow rub um, or wave, but I don't think we'll be shaking hands quite the way we had in the past. I think the office candy dish is gone. I think uh, the bar peanuts uh, also will be a thing of the past, as will salad bars. Uh, the vodka ice luge, uh, I turned to my 35-year-old son. I said, what do you call that when you pour the vodka down the ice and, and people go into it? He said, that's loose. Yeah, that's not the ice loose. So that one ought to go away too, but I'm not sure it will because uh, most of the people doing that aren't thinking clearly. But, but some things we are familiar with will go away. Um, getting a little, little bit more serious about it all, um, what will be the inflections on the healthcare industry? Well, for sure, tele and digital medicine is here to stay. Uh, they've been severely enabled, uh, majorly enabled by uh, COVID-19. People that were reluctant, perhaps maybe it's generational to use telemedicine, had to use it. And so I think it got a gigantic boost from COVID-19. And for certain applications, it works very, very well. I would tell you from the standpoint of the hospital, um, telemedicine visits do not generate the same kind of downstream revenue procedures, operations as in-person medicine, but it's helpful, it has its place, it will evolve, uh, but it's here to stay for sure. Um, I think a second takeaway is we're gonna look at how we strategically plan and build our hospitals in the future as a result of this. Hospitals will become uh, also pandemic hubs, not something we necessarily incorporated into facilities planning in the past. So we're gonna have rooms that can go negative pressure, positive pressure, We'll never build another semi-private room, I don't think. Uh, they really were not very useful uh, when we're talking about isolation. And um, we're going to have to figure out ways to be able to take care of patients without necessarily always being right at the bedside. So to remotely monitor equipment, uh, pumps and other equipment, uh, and to be able to communicate from the bedside with families somewhat remotely. So I think we, you'll see some changes in new hospital construction and renovation because of COVID-19. I think hospitals will begin to stockpile PPE. I mean, up to now, hospitals were trying to figure out uh, how to save working capital and how to have the smallest possible inventory of supplies on hand. Um, we learned the lesson. So now uh, supplies on hand will be more generous and health systems, large health systems like ours, will need to maintain and support strategic stockpiles just in case the next one comes around. I think we'll also look to make some of this equipment. I know RWJ Barnabas Health is considering making masks at some point rather than having to depend on suppliers becoming more self-sufficient. So I think you'll see some changes in supply chain for hospitals. I think um, the healthcare industry has a diminished trust on the global economy. I think the global economy is fine for cars and clothing and washing machines, but our healthcare system is too important uh, to have it as reliant, unfortunately, as it presently is on the global economy. Uh, more ideas, and these really are just ideas. Um, 
refocus. I think we should refocus our public health efforts on improving hygiene and basic health care practices. In the middle of the pandemic, we had to reach out to some of the vulnerable um, communities around the hospital uh, and help with basic hand hygiene and basic good health practices uh, because we were seeing surges of the pandemic in certain uh, vulnerable communities around the hospital. So I think as a country, we can do a better job teaching people uh, how to stay healthy and just um, uh, have more hygiene in their lives. Um, another big area is health insurance. So in this country, the way the financing of healthcare has developed, about 50% of the health insurance is employer sponsored. It works reasonably well. Um, we've seen a little bit of weakness in that system as employers try to save money. They've increased the portion of the cost that falls on the employee. We seem to be dealing with that. But when 20 million Americans are out of work, uh, the health insurance associated with the families of those 20 million Americans is at risk. So I think we'll take a different view on health insurance and health care financing after the pandemic. International travel, that's the way this bug moved around the uh, around the world. The 1918 pandemic, it was actually during World War I, it was the movement of troops that they think helped facilitate transporting that virus around the world. And us, is, we're just a very open society now, and people travel freely between and among countries. So people have talked about um, issuing and some type eventually of an immunity passport in addition to the other passport that you need to move around. And I think um, we know we need to improve our disease registries and the movement of data between healthcare providers, local agencies, departments of health, and the federal government to manage a pandemic like this. So hopefully see, we will see improvement in disease registries and data collection. Just some thoughts coming out of all this. Um, and with that, I'll conclude my remarks. And I don't know, are we going to have questions at the end or? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Next presenter is the Division Chief of Allergy, Immunology, and Infectious Disease, Dr. Susan Borkoff. So I'm the Division Chief of Infectious Diseases, but I'm also the hospital epidemiologist. So as such, I've been involved in areas of planning and response to disaster um, related to infectious agents since I became hospital epidemiologist right before anthrax in 2001. This is different from anything we've ever seen before. And the response to this had to be different. So what I'm gonna talk a little bit about is the fact that this is an infectious disease, but so much of the way we responded to it had really very little to do with tackling the virus itself. This is the lead-in, really, to the other specialty presentations that will follow, and I'll show you why. So this virus, the coronavirus, uses its surface spike proteins to get on into cells by locking onto the ACE2 receptors. Once it's inside the cell, then it reproduces itself and it then triggers immune responses to the virus. But so much of what you see in, in terms of what a virus does or what a pathogen does has to do with what kind of cells it can tackle. And this virus, by using the ACE2 receptors, can infect multiple organs. Some flu strains only cause upper respiratory tract infection because they only attach to receptors on the upper tract. When you have a, something that attacks the lower tract, that's when you got more pneumonia related to, to those flu strains. But this virus can attack cells in all different parts of the body. So it affects the nervous system and um, that's why you get loss of taste and smell. It can affect the lungs. We know that that's a major target. It also can affect, infect the GI tract, the kidneys, and it can cause a tremendous amount of thrombotic complications through effects mainly on endothelial cells that trigger a lot of the clotting cascade. 
So this is a multi-system disease, and as such, it requires a multi-disciplinary approach to care. And the very first thing that we started to do happened really early with the first couple patients that we had, which is that we started doing multidisciplinary rounds every morning. And it was truly a multidisciplinary team where these were not the typical walk rounds that we all grew up with. These were um, rounds in a central location that involved infectious disease specialists, pulmonary critical care specialists, meeting with each of the teams of people caring for the COVID patients. And it started with one physician on a hospital as a service. And in line with the surge that Mr. Gantner showed, rapidly ramped up with more and more teams. So we got, I think the maximum we, we dealt with was 15 teams. And in addition to us, we had people from palliative care, we had infection prevention, we had nursing from the involved units, we had people from case management, bed management, and the appropriate pharmacy specialists. And we met every single day and talked about whatever patients uh, there were clinical concerns with. And this was not only a very efficient way to handle all these patients, it saved an awful lot of um, manpower or person power, shall we say, um, resources. It also gave a central place where we could then refer patients for specific treatments and trials so that we could talk about patients that might benefit from convalescent plasma and then funnel all that information to the, to the hematologists or funnel information to some of the people running the, the antiviral trials. Um, and that happened in the morning and then there were similar rounds for the intensive care units. And this was really a sort of very affirming model of medical care and one that we're not used to. And I think people felt that it was a great way to go and deliver care, but it's very much not in line with the um, way we are reimbursed for our practices. So that happened early on, that happened, that was very efficient. And I think that's part of why we had such good outcomes in our institution. So in addition to this multidisciplinary approach, I think we need to talk about collaborative care and also communication. And the communication with other institutions was very helpful. So when we started seeing a surge of patients, I set up a conference call with the infectious disease physicians who practice here, and they called their friends, and they all got on the call. And we had a meeting of, I forget, I think it was either 30-something or 50-something infectious disease doctors, all on one phone call, some of whom I'd never met before, didn't even know about. And as a result of those discussions, not only did we get very much needed emotional support, but we share, by sharing information, we were the first ones to find out about some of the outbreaks in day, adult daycare centers or in, in um, some of the nursing homes, because that information was not at that point being shared by Department of Health. So by finding out what, what was happening elsewhere, we were able to target our care better. And then educational updates. Very early on, the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine started doing a weekly conference that was dedicated to educating physicians about different aspects of COVID. And that morphed from a purely pulmonary critical care um, arena into conferences on hematologic, renal, cardiac, other aspects of this disease. And this dissemination information was really key. So now I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about the virus and mostly focus on issues related to testing. I think one of the most important things that we have come to understand about COVID is that there's different stages of infection and that the approach to treatment needs to take into account what stage of infection this patient may have. So that early on in infection, the effects that you're seeing are the effects of the virus itself or the viral response phase where you get the constitutional symptoms, fever, cough, most 
patients may never be admitted to the hospital. Uh, they get admitted to the hospital when they start to progress and have shortness of breath and hypoxia, or sometimes they present with clots, pulmonary emboli, or strokes, or other evidence of viral effects. But then the patient may go into this second phase, which is a host inflammatory response phase, where the virus may actually no longer be active. And what you're seeing is this unfettered um, inflammatory response out of proportion to trying to get rid of the virus. And why the reason that this is so important to understand and the reason that this sort of leads into what, what Dr. Sundaram is going to say and what other people are going to say is that if you don't take into account where the patient is, you can actually do a lot of harm in your approach to treatment. So that early on we targeted the virus, we targeted with antiviral such as remdesivir, and we target it with convalescent plasma, which um, provides antibodies to try to clear the virus. Whereas later on, what, what we think is most important is treatment of that inflammatory response with steroids, perhaps with other immune modulators, and um, data is continuing to emerge as far as that goes. And, once we started thinking in those terms, I think we very quickly started to see a decrease in the number of patients that we ended up transferring to the ICU and started to have an improvement in our overall outcome. So now I'm going to talk about the virus a little bit more and talk about what, what do people need to know. So one of the key things that when they talk about why why infections propagate, why they continue to spread in the community has to do with this concept of R0, which is the basic reproductive number, which says if a patient is infected, how many other people are they likely to infect? And if you have a number above one, you where each person infects more than one person, then the virus continues to spread. If you get that number below one, then the infection should start to die out. And typically they talk about COVID having an R0 of two to three. So it's somewhere between seasonal influenza and SARS and far less easily spread than measles. And this is actually from today's um, briefing by uh, the governor where they talked about what our R0 has been in the state of New Jersey. And it's really dramatic that when we were starting to see this huge surge of patients. They are not in the area, was 5.3, which is far higher than they talk about in general with this virus. But the stay at home order was issued on March 21st. And by the time we hit our peak hospital census, uh, the R0 was about one. And it's gone down below one. And even though it's gone up a little bit recently, which is concerning, it's still below one. So that's still suggest that we should be seeing a continued decrease in the number of infections in the area. This could change at any time. So don't go to bars, don't let your kids hang out, um, and take the lessons from um, Texas and the other states. So one of the other issues, and I think it's a huge issue, is when people think about testing and they think about shedding of virus and they see people that shed for a very long time uh, people need to get a little bit better understanding of what does that in fact mean so there have been studies that show that from if you look at days from from symptom onset um, the amount of shedding goes down pretty rapidly and this is a study that looks at what the CT value is. And I'll explain CT value in the next slide. That has to do with the uh, cycle um, of the PCR that's positive. So PCR testing, which is what we've been doing in terms of screening, doing nasal screens, it's very sensitive and it's very specific. So a positive PCR really helps to tell you that there is or has been virus there. But this measures the viral nucleic acid. It doesn't tell you whether you've got infectious virus there. 
So you have to be able to live, um, to interpret these PCR results in the context of what's the sample that's connect being collected? Where did you get it from? How did you get the specimen? Is nasopharyngeal versus nasal? Um, how good is the sample that's been collected? You know, did, if it was a nasopharyngeal swab, did they really pick that swab up to the point of discomfort as they were supposed to, or did they just sort of wave it around and not have as much um, specimen on on the swab? And then different PCRs may have different analytic sensitivity. Um, and then you also have to interpret a positive or a rather a negative result based on the time point of when this testing was done. And then the pretest probability of illness and the disease prevalent in the community. So if very few people have infection to be spreading, then a positive could be a false positive. If everybody has it, uh, then a positive is probably real. So this is a study that looked at the variations in the false negative rate of that PCR. So the probability that a test will be negative in someone who truly has infection. And the um, x-axis is the number of days since exposure. So it's very clear that if you test someone within a day or two of exposure, you're not going to find virus. And if you test people around the time that they are symptomatic, you're going to get a positive result uh, in about 70 to 80 percent of the time. And over the next few days, that probability of false negative is at its lowest. But then once you go out a couple of weeks, it starts to go up again. So if you have someone come into your ER who's been sick for two and a half weeks and their test is negative, they may be on that upswing. And that's why you're getting a false positive result, a false negative result. And that doesn't mean they were never infected. It probably means they're post-infectious at that time. Because when they look at when people transmit virus, a lot of the viral transmission happens before the patient has the onset of symptoms. So in this study, um, the most infectious point was 0.7 days prior to symptoms onset. And that accounted for a lot of the secondary cases that we're seeing. If you're only screening symptomatic people, you're gonna miss people. And if you try to correlate this, because the way you know about infectious virus is by trying to actually do viral cultures. One of the um, fallouts of the successful development of new diagnostic techniques for viruses is that most places no longer do viral cultures. We don't do viral cultures in our lab at all anymore. We only do rapid diagnostic techniques. So we don't have the setup to try to culture this virus. Plus, given its infectiousness, we can't do this in a regular lab. This has to be done under the L3 um, isolation type of condition. So there's not very many places that can routinely test for, for live virus. And I answer people all the time and say, sorry, we can't do this. But in the study setting where they've done that, um, they've shown that they could culture virus for up to about a week to 10 days after symptom onset, often before symptom onset, but after 10 days, not. So when they look at how long people are infectious, the clinical attack rate in the, in the left graph, where that graph hits six to seven days, that's when their clinical attack rate, whether it was a primary or secondary contact, went down to zero. And, um, in, and this has been shown in multiple studies. So that even though people have positive PCRs for a long time, it doesn't mean that they're still contagious. It doesn't mean they're still infectious to other people. And that's a really hard concept to um, accept, especially when you're starting. To, this is another way they looked at it. Um, the graph at the bottom looks at uh, viral isolation. I'm sorry, there's a sticker on this. I can't read the bottom of the slide. Um, it um, looks at the, the ability to isolate virus based on time post exposure and also how that correlates with the amount of virus if they do quantitative PCRs. And 
the longer you go from exposure, the less likely you're going to get virus. If you do a PCR that has a very small amount of virus in it that triggers positive, that's not going to predict infectious virus. So the question keeps coming up, why don't we get the results of those quantitative PCRs? And part of the reason that it's difficult to analyze is that nasal swabs aren't a quantitative specimen. It's not like doing a PCR from blood where you know how much is going in there. But if you do happen to get a PCR result and it has a very high cycle number, that means they're not likely to be infectious. And, and we can sometimes find that out. So this sort of puts it together, the different tests and the um, time frames. Before symptom onset, you're getting PCRs that turn positive, that's the blue line, and you are able to isolate virus from the respiratory tract, that's the red line. Note that that red line comes back down to baseline sometime early in that second week, after which you really can't culture virus. And that's about the point at which your antibodies start to come up. So if you've got someone who's got positive antibodies, they don't have infectious virus. And we have to start working on a way to make better and more rational use of some of our testing. But there's a lot of unanswered questions. One of the big ones is that these studies that show shedding lasting maybe 10, up to 9, 10 days, those were done in normal hosts. They were not done in highly immunocompromised patients. So if Dr. Solowitz wants to ask me, what about my cancer patient and they're still PCR positive, can I prove that they don't have infectious virus? I can't. We need more data on that subject. And then the question is, what does it mean to have antibodies? Do those antibodies protect? Um, and how long do antibodies last? There's starting to be studies that come out which show that the less sick someone was when they got COVID, the shorter time they have detectable levels of antibodies. And we don't know if when it goes away, that means they're still not protected. Um, so we don't know yet about reinfection. And then this raises all these questions of how should you screen, how often, what tests to use. I don't have all the answers to those. Some of this is evolving based on the guidance from the Department of Health, which is also the requirements from the Department of Health as we open up. But I think that what we're going to try to be doing over the next few weeks is getting to a much more rational place about the perpetual rescreening of the patients as we reopen, as long, of course, as we don't have another big surge. So I'm going to stop now and, and let Dr. Sundaram take over. Our next presenter is the newly appointed Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. He's also the Medical Director of the MICU, Dr. Jag Sundaram. Uh, thank you all, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19. Uh, since I also work in the ICU and work with colleagues in the ICU, I just want to say that the surge planning involved obviously the ICU because of the number of patients we had at some point over 60 in ICUs and we uh, the directors of all the ICUs came together with the leadership from the Department of Medicine the hospital administration and we set about planning on surging for patients that we predicted were going to land up in the ICU and I must say that uh, at the end of the day I would say it was a huge success with uh, cooperation between the departments of medicine, anesthesia, surgery, where we had multiple care providers taking care of uh, very sick patients, learning very quickly management of these patients of ARDS, managing to prone patients with nursing staff, learning quickly how to do these things. And so I think this was an, exp a an example of how collaboration, cooperation, across departments, across the medical school and, and the hospital shows how you can actually make a, a very make it a very successful story with incredibly good outcomes. With that said, I'll talk a little about the pulmonary manifestations uh, since COVID is predominantly a pulmonary disease. Now, as Susan mentioned earlier, earlier <clears throat> coronavirus uses the ACE2 receptors on the target cells uh, to enter this, uh, into enter the body, and so the question is, why is the lung such a, a prime target? 
And so one has to look at the ACE receptors in certain parts of the body to understand why uh, coronavirus uh, kind of is predominantly in those parts. It also helps us understand the epidemiology of this because we know that older people seem to be affected, people with CPD and asthma seem to be affected, and, and those who are obese. So is there something about the ACE receptor distribution that may actually help us understand this? So if you look at the ACE receptor distribution, what we see is that everything is the expression of the ACE receptor. It's much more in older people than in young children, and therefore it seems that young children therefore may be protected or get a less severe form of the uh, disease. We also see expression in the airways of this, again, okay? much more in the older people than in the babies. Asthmatics have a higher ACE to expression, though. Also, in the last COPD, we have higher ACE to expression. So, as you uh, can understand, and the, the involvement of various aspects of the systems is really dependent on the ACE2 expression and the way that the virus enters the body. Now, we know that there is a pre-symptomatic phase. Susan alluded to the, the fact that actually in the pre-symptomatic phase is when many people can be very infectious. And then you have a symptomatic phase where the virus propagates, gets, gets into the system and start, people start to have this viral program. We don't necessarily in the hospital see that uh, group of people, fortunately, hopefully they stay home and don't, you know, spread the disease. But who we see are the ones who come in and who are toxic. And, and that's during that slow smoldering phase of that illness that we see them in the hospital. And then during that inflammatory phase that was alluded to also previously. So uh, if you look at what's happening to the lung, even in the asymptomatic, the pre-symptomatic phase of COVID-19, there's data to show that actually the lungs are already involved. That the ACE2 receptors within the lung have uh, you know, the virus is propagating within them, although the patients really are not showing any symptoms. And their lab studies are getting normal. And what you see is CAT scan evidence. So what we call round glass opacities, especially in the periphery, there are these rounded densities. They usually can be uh, on one side of the other unilateral, bilateral, and maybe just peripheral and affecting one of those. So here's an example of and images of patients who have COVID-19 but who are pretty asymptomatic. But if you did CT scans on them, you see these ground glass densities that are present in either the upper or lower lobes, which are peripheral and ground glass. And then you have the symptomatic phase where they classically the virus is starting to propagate, the patients start to get a sore throat, myalgia, fever, and cough. Now, it's during this phase that you can also continue to see CT findings. And again, you may see a normal CAT scan, although as the progression happens and as the disease continues and as the duration of symptomology continues, you start to see more and more changes in the CAT scan of consolidation of bilateral disease, uh, uh, continued peripheral distribution. But then in the later phases is when you saw, start to see linear opacities and much more diffuse disease bilaterally, where you start to worry about the manifestations that lead to severe hypoxia and ARDS. So in this is an image actually of a patient that we had who presented early in this hypoxic phase of illness, the silent hypoxic phase. And as you can see, the chest X-ray seems to show some densities in the periphery. You do a CAT scan, the coronal images, uh, uh, the uh, match what you see on the chest X-ray, and you see much more clearly those ground glass densities that are peripheral. And it's pretty diffuse in this situation, in this patient, both upper and lower lobe. Um, what these people generally do then, they get admitted, they're on the floors, they seem to require some low levels of oxygen, they feel somewhat short of breath, but not necessarily all the time. They can be quite tachypnic, but otherwise comfortable looking. They do have a lot of difficulty mobilizing thick secretions, and that's important to know, because this phase uh, is where maybe some things could be done pulmonary-wise that could prevent uh, the progression to air RDS and ongoing uh, inflammatory responses. This can last for uh, several days before it progresses onto the uh, inflammatory phase. 
So you have this slow smoldering phase, the same patient now, second and third day, you start to see that that infiltrate has become much more, uh, uh, has started to become more central. You start to see more diffuse involvement, perihilar and pericardiac involvement uh, of opacities. And, and you start to see these uh, um, areas where in the peribronchial areas, you start to see uh, densities and opacities, suggesting that there is ongoing bronchiolitis and alveolitis that uh, leads to that mucus production. And here's where you start to see more and more hypoxia. So what's the reason behind the hypoxia in these COVID-19 patients? There is a, a feeling that is very similar to the mucus described in you know, the purpose because of bronchial trees were plugged with mucus in these asthmatic All those that utilize not dilated, it's not very helpful. However, the peripheral airway is a little bit more than a little bit more than a Inspect mucus, mucus infection, and bronchial edema. That, that's the reason that lead, it leads, this leads to ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, and absent ventilation, but persistent perfusion. And that persistent perfusion may be, again, a part of the manifestation of COVID 19, where maybe deficits in how uh, the normal hypoxic vasoconstriction is affected in patients, leading to severe hypoxia. So, in terms of Many times it's been described that these patients sit there, they're hypoxic to a very low level of, uh, of uh, oxygen saturations, sitting at 70 or 75 percent and not complaining about their hypoxia. And therefore, they're called happy hypoxic people with a lack of sensation or dyspnea. What's the reason for that? There are many physiological explanations, but if you go back to primary respiratory physiology, you could probably explain this a lot. One is that these patients are blowing down their CO2, so they're generally hypocapnic, and the strongest stimulus to breathe is hypercapnic. So if you become hypercapnic as you're hypoxic, you will become dyspneic, and you'll have the sensation of dyspnea. But if you're hypocapnic, you can go down to much lower oxygen levels before hypoxic becomes sensed. The second is maybe they do have a blood response to hypoxia. There, you see this in older people, you see this in diabetics, diabetic neuropathy, in blood hypoxic response. Again, as the pulse ox, you know, we me measure oxygen saturations using pulse oximetry. And so as the saturation drops about 80%, the pulse oximetry actually becomes very unreliable. And so, uh, you know, take your reason value, which may not be necessarily true. And finally, these patients are often having high degrees of fever, this causes a shift of their oxygen dissociation curve to the right. So for the same level of uh, PO2, their oxygen saturations are very different. So for those reasons, it is why these patients may just be sitting there being quite hypoxic. So what options do we have during the silent hypoxic phase, which could help prevent these people from moving to the ICU? We have considered bronchodilators. Like I said, we, we didn't really see very effective uh, therapies with, with uh, the good effect with bronchodilators, but there could, could be a consideration for things like mucolytic agents, especially high dose and acetylcysteine. There's really no good data on this, but it would be useful to consider uh, randomized controlled trials of high dose and acetylcysteine because it has been shown to be useful in other conditions like COPD, which uh, with reduction because of its mucolytic, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant properties may help in normalizing you know, the an inflammatory response, reducing levels of uh, CRP and IL-6, which we know triggers the hyperinflammatory response. Uh, so how else could you treat the hypoxia? Obviously, oxygen therapy is necessary, but what we found was really useful was uh, explaining to patients to do to sleep on their tummies or prone positioning for prolonged periods of time because by keeping them prone, uh, you improve ventilation perfusion matching as much of the dependent portions of the lung were what were in water. You, you could treat, uh, train them to do what's called box breathing, 
which essentially keeps the alveoli open, similar to post-slept breathing. And finally, obviously, when their oxygen needs go on increasing, you need to place them on high-flow oxygen. Unfortunately, we weren't able to use uh, non-invasive ventilatory measures in these patients very often, like CPAP or bilevel therapy. The reason being that those with a loose-fitting mask can lead to aerosolization of viral particles and cause serious problems. So, uh, however, in Europe, they did use a helmet device with the expiratory port being filtered, and they were able to successfully treat people with non-invasive ventilation with fairly high amounts of pressure. That helmet device is available now, and uh, we are looking into having many of them so that you don't necessarily have to use negative pressure rooms in these patients. Additionally, uh, at Princeton University, they're actually providing monitors like ventilator monitors. They're, they're starting to build them by engineers there to be able to actually monitor the patients on helmet devices to look at their respiratory rate, their tidal volumes, uh, minute ventilation and set off alarms so that uh, you can actually monitor them like you would a ventilator. And that would, in the potential likely second surge, which uh, uh, we have to be prepared for, would be a very useful way of dealing with uh, such patients. At, a, uh, at you know, we could do it on 30 to 40 patients with multiple monitors being used without the need for ICU care. Finally, you know. Uh, if these patients progress, you start to need to have to obviously intubate these people. What we learned is that we were intubating people very early on uh, in the illness, early in their uh, hypoxic phase, and we realized that may not be such a good thing. Uh, and as we learned from the disease, we started to uh, delay intubations to a point where we really needed to, which I think helped with the outcomes. Um, and so in the inflammatory phases when you have frank ARD, yes, you have the increase in the protein, D dimers, by lateral pulmonary infiltration. So you look at the same person day five to day eight, you start to see these dense infiltration, much more lower lobes, uh, much, much more uh, involvement of both lungs, and then a cast at this point. Uh, Chris, does that work? The video. Okay. Well, the video is supposed to show ARDS with diffuse uh, process in bile in both the lungs. So, well, what's the reason for this immune response? So you have the virus entering uh, the lungs. There's an antigen presentation that happens. There is release of cytokines. The macrophages act as antigen-presenting cells. And then you have the usual cellular humoral-mediated immune response. So the humoral response is important for the, for the antibodies that you detect, the IgG and IgM, for the presence of the previous infection. But the T cell response uh, also is, is important in trying to get rid of the virus. But if there's an overactivation of this immune in response, you get what we call a cytokine storm. And that's what we described in these patients leading to the process of ARDS. So if you have an inflammatory response to this viral infection, you could either have a protective process uh, where you have early interferon gamma response, and that leads to survival and a protective immune response with minimal epithelial and endothelial cell death, uh, reduced a vascular leak, but if on the other hand you have a delayed immune, uh, a delayed interferon response, and you have inflammatory cytokines being released by the pro-inflammatory mediators, then you have a huge uh, uh, change in epithelial and endothelial structure. You have damage to them. You have vascular leak that leads to the ARDS that we see, and need for mechanical ventilation and. Uh, uh, and essentially puts them at high risk for death. So, like I mentioned, under normal circumstances, if you had the normal immune responses, you should not necessarily see this massive surge of cytokines, the release of uh, mediators that leads to lung injury. But on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, 
the, the cytokine storm that, that we see in many of these in B2 ARDS. And also, the process in pulmonary vascular nature and normality in the thrombotic process is that, that Dr. Phillips is going to talk about in these uh, patients. So, uh, how should we respond to this kind of ARDS picture? We know that sepsis leads to ARDS. So, we try to use the same therapy that uh, uh, you know, uh, either reduce the uh, mortality from ARDS itself or reduce the risk for ARDS. And so the first thing you go to is steroids like we do for a lot of pulmonary diseases. And the data out of uh, China early in the illness suggested maybe that there was something to steroids in this disease process. And what they showed was a reduced risk of death in a very small group of people with ARDS. Uh, and so it was an observational study, and it wasn't clear this would be useful uh, or we would be able to use uh, steroids in this population. However, uh, and, and they showed a reduction clearly in mortality with methylprednisolone. However, more recently, uh, the uh, British press just published uh, uh, the uh, early resu results from the, what they call the recovery trial in COVID patients of over 2,000 people who are randomized to either get dexamethasone 6 milligrams once a day by mouth or by IV injection for 10 days compared to over 4,000 people who didn't get it. And those who received dexamethasone showed a 28-day mortality re reduction in uh, either if they required oxygen or if they were on uh, some form of respiratory intervention. So it's now we have more randomized control trial evidence suggesting that we should be using steroids to reduce mortality in this group of people uh, in the form of dexamethasone at least, especially in those needing oxygen or requiring more than just oxygen and ventilatory support. This data has not been published. It's interesting. I think this was interim analysis, uh, that, but, but clearly the numbers are very impressive. So this suggests that the, what the pandemic has shown us is that because of the huge number of people being affected, trials are being done at a very rapid phase, uh, allowing for newer therapeutic targets, newer therapies to uh, be made, to be used in this kind of illness. There are others that have, we don't have data yet, but we've used those for instance, an six inhibitor in this inflammatory phase to reduce cytokine storm. There's some Suggestion from, from uh, ongoing studies that this reduces mortality. This data that maybe we could use when patients go into uh, renal failure and require dialysis, and we use continuous renal replacement therapies. That while we use replacement therapies, you could use filters to filter out cytokines to reduce the cytokine storm. Again, um, we don't have enough evidence to do it on a routine basis, but there's ongoing research on that. And finally, of course, uh, we did talk about the pulmonary vascular involvement and the microthrombosis, and there is suggestion that early use of anticoagulation and, and TPA, even in this population, may be very useful to reduce the thrombotic processes in the lungs, which Dr. Phipps is going to expand on. And I'll stop there. I'd like to introduce now the Division Chief of Hematology at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Dr. Claire Phillip. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about COVID-associated uh, coagulopathy and thrombosis. So uh, about the third week of April, uh, the Washington Post and some other uh, uh, journals alerted the public to the clotting, blood clotting complications that were being observed in coronavirus patients. And they, they said it crept up on us. Well, uh, that is actually true in that it was initially unrecognized in the first few weeks of the New York, uh, of the New York surge in March. But by April, here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, there had already been considerable buzz among our own pulmonary critical care colleagues, among colleagues external, externally in the thrombosis community, 
And we already had developed with multidisciplinary um, input a COVID anticoagulation protocol that was already deployed at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. So abnormal coagulation and other hemologic parameters are associated with poor prognosis in COVID patients. And that's been recognized by, in a number of studies, uh, particularly from China. And so what we see is that uh, the D-dimers, IL-6, are increasing uh, with time from illness onset. And there's a big difference between survivors and non-survivors. Lymphopenia is observed uh, worse in uh, non-survivors, as is uh, increases in LDH and serum ferritin. Fibrinogen also increases in patients with COVID in most, most of the cases. In a small proportion of cases, uh, when multi-organ uh, multi failure is uh, incipient, some of them develop actually a hypofibrinogenemia. But in general, COVID coagulopathy is somewhat different from classical DIC, and an elevated fibrinogen and elevated D-dimers are, are uh, observed. There are minimal changes in the PT and APTT. As a matter of fact, if you use the INR, you may miss the elevation in the PT uh, because it is that subtle. Thrombocytopenia is not prominent, and elevated IL-6 levels correlate with elevated fibrinogen levels. The coagulopathy is related to the severity of the illness and inflammation, not viral activity. And there's a marked D-dimer elevation which precedes multi-organ failure and overt DIC. And another manifestation that has, has been observed is that patients with COVID do not commonly have a bleeding complications. What's been found in, based on autopsy studies is this issue of microthrombi and microangiopathy in the lung. And this is a series from uh, New Orleans, uh, an autopsy series, where you can see fibrin thrombi within the small vessels, which is shown by the arrow, and capillaries shown by the arrow head. And there's also a stain, uh, a brown stain, or CD61, which appears and demonstrates that it's mixed fibrin. The other uh, thing that is make the carriers that demonstrate atypia and which are producing platelets and contribute to the uh, microthrombi in the lung. The other manifest, clotting manifest that has been observed is macrothrombi or venous thromboembolism. This is taken from a autopsy series of 12 from Germany, which demonstrated that seven out of the 12 uh, autopsy specimens demonstrated VTE that was unsuspected prior to death, with four having massive pulmonary embolism plus bilateral DVT three bilateral DVTs, and interestingly, out of nine men in the series of 12, six of them demonstrated prostatic venous plexus. The risk of VTE has been shown in cohort studies as well as in autopsy series. And this is a study from uh, Amsterdam, which shows a cumulative incidence of VTE in hospitalized COVID patients who actually all were given a standard dose thromboprophylaxis. And you can see an astonishing 40% cumulative incidence of VTE in the hospitalized patients. And there is a um, even higher risk among patients who are in the ICU compared to ward patients. And because of this study and, many, uh, and several other cohort studies, which demonstrate uh, this high risk of VTE, uh, the question about whether hospitalized COVID patients should all receive anticoagulation seems to be pretty clear, and that all hospitalized COVID patients on admission, unless they have an excessive bleeding risk, should receive anticoagulation. And furthermore, COVID discharged patients should be considered for anticoagulation post-discharge. 
So we developed here, and this was done in um, collaboration. This was actually uh, had a lot of multidisciplinary input, an anticoagulation uh, algorithm, if you will, to standardize anticoagulation here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and to improve outcomes. And uh, basically, all patients who were hospitalized at co uh, with COVID are given a thromboprof thromboprophylactic uh, doses of anticoagulation, although in higher than standard doses. And then there is a step up to uh, full dose anticoagulation with respiratory deterioration or if there's a VTE that's diagnosed. And we think that this uh, approach did improve outcomes here at, at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. And I want to acknowledge actually the multidisciplinary expertise that went into the development of this program. Uh, uh, first, uh, the hematology group uh, who works with me, Dr. Guo, Dr. Cabany, and Dr. Schrideron, all of whom worked in developing this protocol, in deploying the protocol, in disseminating the protocol. And then we had a lot of educational sessions for the hospitalists and the primary teams uh, to um, uh, make this protocol uh, widely used throughout the hospital. And of course, the pulmonary group, which first alerted us to this issue and who contributed extensively to the development of the protocol, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Sundaram, and Dr. Jagpal, and of course, Dr. Barakoff from ID, who's been everywhere with COVID. And finally, uh, the GI group, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brandt, who really kept hematology on the straight and narrow, so we didn't have uh, GI bleeding complications with uh, the anticoagulation. And finally, uh, pharmacy, Dr. Dupali Dixit, who worked with us to develop the protocol and uh, disseminated it within the pharmacy group here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Another known complication from COVID-19 is kidney failure, and here to talk about that is the Division Chief of Nephrology, Dr. Richard Mann. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me here this evening to speak about COVID and the kidney. Um, if you look at my very first slide, Oops, my very first slide is not here. Um, the, um, if you want to learn more about this, you can go to um, rwjmsdom.org and click on YouTube, and you'll see the medical grand rounds that were given on various topics, including this one. But I'll start with this. An overlooked possibility, um, possibly fatal, coronavirus crisis, a dire need for kidney dialysis. This was a headline from the New York Times in April of this year. And they quoted Dr. David Goldfarb as saying, the nephrologists in New York City are going slightly crazy making sure that everyone with kidney failure gets treatment. Nothing like this has ever been seen in terms of the number of people needing kidney replacement therapy. We too saw a great many people who needed to be dialyzed. But the real question is, is there a unique uh, disorder associated with COVID in the kidney? Or is this just the high rate of kidney failure that we typically see with critically ill patients in the ICU? So we know that the, there is a very high rate of AKI in the ICU. In a recent study of um, multinational study of over 1,800 patients from 97 ICUs, they reported that AKI occurred in 57% of these patients within one week of admission. And severe stage two or three AKI developed in 39% and 13.5% required renal replacement therapy. By comparison, mortality in ICU with an MI was 20%, but was 40 to 55% for those who developed or required renal replacement therapy. And the mortality was only 15 to 25% for those with sepsis without AKI. And ARDS requiring mechanical ventilation, they saw a mortality rate of 30 to 40%. So AKI has been shown to increase susceptibility to infections, double the rate of respiratory failure, and directly and indirectly impair cardiac function. This was a study of ARDS patients in the ICU, and it was a total of almost 2,400 patients 
from 459 ICUs in 50 different countries. And what they found was that AKI occurred in 39% of patients with ARDS. And if you look along the bottom of this slide, you'll see that those without any AKI had a much higher rate of survival. Um, those with moderate AKI had a higher rate of mortality, 45%. And those with severe AKI had a rate of almost 53% mortality. There is a lot of crosstalk between the kidneys and the lungs. And we know that the kidneys can cause ARD, kidney failure can cause ARDS, but ARDS, which is a major manifestation uh, in patients with COVID, also causes acute kidney injury. And it does through, this through a variety of mechanisms, including the release of pro-inflammatory mediators from injured lung. We also know that hypoxemia and hypocapnia reduce renal blood flow in compression, and finally, increased sympathetic activity can cause renal artery constriction. All of this is associated with ARDS and can cause acute kidney injury. Here we see a series of studies from Europe and US showing that rate of AKI COVID patients is probably somewhere in the range of 40 to 50, 60%. If you want to look at just those who had stage two or stage three, the rate is probably more like 35%, somewhere in the 30 percent range. This was perhaps the single largest study that was reported, um, and it was AKI in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 from among 13 academic and community hospitals. We looked at stage two first. April 5th this year. They looked at the COVID 19. In almost 2,000 of them, or about 36.6%. And there's a breakdown here in terms of stage one, stage two, and stage three of acute kidney injury. About 35% of these patients experience mortality. 26% of these patients were 39% of these patients were still hospitalized. They can't determine. Of those with AKI, 14.3% required renal replacement therapy. 96.8% of those were renal replacement therapy. That this is called temporary leaking. Um, there are requirements for them to end the requirement for replacement therapy. Only 21.7% of non-ventilated patients were renal replacement therapy. And this is true of COVID in general. Including age, diabetes, cardiac, so these black ways, hypertension, and the ventilation and patients. So those who required ventilation and developed AKI, more than half of them lost AKI within 24 hours of intubation. So there seemed to be a great correlation between the response to the infection leading to the requirement for intubation and the requirement for renal replacement therapy. And as shown here, the severity of AKI correlated very well with mortality in this large study, with um, the green bar being those who are discharged. Um, I'm also colorblind, and my wife had to tell me that was a green bar. Uh, the green bar um, uh, resulted in AKI um, stage three. Very few of them ended up discharged. Um, over 50% of them died. And Close to 50% of them were still hospitalized at the time that this paper was reported, whereas with no AKI, the rate of mortality was probably in the range of 5%, and the vast majority had been discharged. So the true incidence of AKI is hard to know because we really don't know the denominator of patients with COVID-19, but at least it appears that in the ICU, it's probably in the range of 30 to 40%. However, there's probably a much higher rate of renal involvement early on, just as Dr. Sundaram mentioned that you can have involvement of the lungs before it becomes clinically apparent. A number of studies have shown that patients arriving in the hospital have a significant rate of hematuria and proteinuria, um, and we found that to be the case as well. Um, and they, we also have uh, seen in the literature that AKI, hematuria, and proteinuria all are associated with an increased mortality in COVID-19 patients. So this comes from a study out of China in which they demonstrated that the patients who had heavy proteinuria had a 
the hazard ratio that was significantly elevated for mortality. Also those with hematuria. Um, those who had a peak serum creatinine above 133 micromoles per liter, which converted to a unit that we're more familiar with, would be about 1.5 milligrams per deciliter, had an increased rate of mortality. And again, progressively increased hazard ratio for mortality with increasing severity of AKI. So what are the causes of AKI in COVID-19 patients? Well, there is certainly pre-renal azotemia that contributes to this. And many of the patients that we admitted with COVID-19 had been feeling ill for a number of days. They had little PO intake, high fevers, they had larger and sensible losses, and about 3% of diarrhea. And on a large extent, many patients are bone depleted. It's important to assess the bone status level, and it's very important to assess patients who believe you have to be to remain really to hypotension, and hypotension, of course, leads to intrinsic renal injury. But we also found that it was important to avoid volume overload because that compromised respiration and led to problems for our pulmonary colleagues. So aside from volume depletion, pre-renal azotemia may result from vasodilatation, as seen in sepsis. And it may also result from diminished cardiac output, cardiorenal syndrome type 1, as there's increasing evidence of COVID-19-induced cardiomyopathy and myocarditis. This is a study out of New Orleans where they looked at uh, patients with AKI um, and COVID and 161 patients with acute kidney injury. Um, AKI occurred in 61% of their ICU patients, but only 14% of those on the wards. And they found there was a 50% mortality in those with AKI. They surmised that most of the AKI was due to traditional insults to the kidney in sick patients in the ICU in particular hemodynamic instability, hypotension, and they surmised this based on the fact that these patients had prolonged periods of hypotension and had a urinalysis that was consistent with acute tubular injury. Um, there were other causes that they found. Um, there's been a scattering of reports of um, collapsing glomerulopathy in African Americans with COVID-19, but in this particular study, there were 13% of patients with AKI who had evidence on sediment, uh, urinary sediment um, of acute tubular injury, but no obvious explanation as to why they should have acute uh, tubular injury. So there may in fact be, as we'll see in the next few slides, a COVID nephropathy that occurs. And this COVID nephropathy, given the high rate of um, proteinuria and hematuria on arrival in the hospital, may be fairly prevalent, but it doesn't mean that, that there can be only one insult to the kidneys to a Cause acute, cause acute kidney injury. And it's likely that a lot of the AKI that we've seen were due to traditional insults uh, to the kidney. But that 13%, could it be due to COVID nephropathy, where there is precedent for virus induced renal disease? And there may be a COVID 19 nephropathy. The, the spike S protein of COVID 19, as you've heard already tonight, binds to the ACE2 receptor. And the S protein is then activated and cleaved by cellular transmembrane serine proteases, allowing the virus to release fusion peptides for membrane fusion and to enter the cell. The co-expression of ACE2 and these transmembrane serine proteases is key to the entry of the virus into host cells. And single cell RNA sequencing analysis revealed that podocytes and proximal straight tubular cells highly express both ACE2 and, and the necessary transmembrane serine proteases. And on autopsy studies, we find that there is a direct cytopathic effect of viral invasion of the kidneys. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see an inflammatory infiltrate. You can also see by um, immunochemistry a demonstration of accumulation of COVID NP antigen in the tubular cells. And you can see an influx of macrophages and natural killer cells, as well as activation of the terminal components of complements C5B to C9, the so-called membrane attack complex, that has been instrumental in the cause of renal disease in a number of disorders. In a second autopsy study, um, nine of 26 patients demonstrated clinical signs of kidney injury. And again, they saw signs of tubular injury, including the loss of proximal tubular brush border and vacuolar degeneration. And we looked under electron microscopy, so viral particles in the side of the cells. Less cell aggregates and peritubular capillaries in the peritubular capillaries and damaged endothelial cells. There was ACE2 upregulation in the tubules and the podocytes. 
in a study of 40 hospitalized patients in France, they found that 75% of them developed at least two proximal tubular defects consistent with incomplete Fanconi syndrome. And Fanconi syndrome is a disorder in which the proximal tubular of the kidney is injured, and the things that are typically reabsorbed in the proximal tubule therefore leak downstream and out into the urine. And these would include protein, phosphate, uh, uric acid, and glucose. And they found that there was proteinuria in 88% of them, a renal phosphate leak in about 55%, hyperuricosuria in 43%, and normal glycemic glycosuria in about 30%. Of the eight patients who developed stage two and stage three AKI, seven had preceding Fanconi syndrome. So this would be a clinical manifestation of the involvement of the proximal tubular cells by the virus. This study and the two autopsy studies suggest that the virus enters the tubular epithelial cells and podocytes and causes direct cytopathic injury. Viral invasion in the kidneys is associated with red blood cell aggregation in the peritubular capillaries. Endothelial cell injury, fibrin thrombi has been seen within the glomeruli and occasional pigmented casts suggested of rhabdo. There's an influx of inflammatory cells, including macrophages, NK cells, lymphocytes, and activation complement with the formation of the membrane attack complex. Now, as far as dialysis goes for COVID-19 patients, we did have to dialyze a large number of patients, but the indications for dialysis were no different from those that we see in non-COVID patients. There appears to be a higher rate of clotting of filters, no big surprise since these patients are hypercoagulable. And Dr. Philip already presented um, an algorithmic approach such that we were um, heparinizing these patients. Um, in our experience, the need for renal replacement therapy often arised in intubated patients on pressor support, and therefore we were mostly providing CBVHD as the most common type of renal replacement therapy. And in those who require intermittent hemodialysis treatment, we, we used um, whenever it was medically appropriate, only three hours of dialysis twice a week um, in order to limit the exposure of the staph to the virus. So in summary, I think there are more questions than answers. Um, renal involvement characterized by proteinuria and hematuria is very common in hospitalized COVID-19 patients and carries an increased risk of mortality. AKI is seen in about 30 to 40% of all COVID patients in the ICU and can be caused by hemodynamic changes, the cytokine storm, organ crosstalk, and possibly by direct viral invasion of the kidney and I would point out that very often with AKI in the ICU, it's not a single renal insult, maybe one or all of the above. Whether AKI occurs more often in critically ill COVID-19 patients than in critically ill patients without COVID-19 infection is unclear. The rate of AKI mortality is high in both groups. And that New York Times headline with which we began may simply reflect the overwhelming number of patients with COVID-19 rather than a higher proportion of such patients with AKI. There is a large multicenter study in progress to learn more about renal involvement in COVID-19 patients. Co-investigators at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital include Drs. Puri, Ahmed, and Radbell. So I'd like to say thank you. The faculty of the Department of Medicine, along with our residents and fellows, have been on the front line throughout this pandemic, during which over 1,100 COVID patients were hospitalized at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak about what we've learned from the literature and from our firsthand experience. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. David Fischler, who will speak some more about the lungs and COVID. Thanks. Now, as we've been treating COVID patients here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, our private practice physicians here on our medical staff have faced challenges of their own. Here to speak about those, Dr. David Fischler from Pulmonary and Intensive Care Specialists of New Jersey and the Associate Medical Director of the MICU here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wanted to spend a couple thanks out to a couple people before I get started. First and foremost, I want to thank my wife and kids for not throwing me out on the street after I was infected in mid-March and for sticking with me. Uh, secondly, I want to thank my partners in my practice from Pulmonary Intensive Care Specialists of New Jersey. A great team effort to get through this together. Uh, also, I want to thank Dr. Salowitz for inviting me to speak. Uh, we have some amazing stories from the medical school about what was done to get through this, but there are also stories from the community that need to be told. 
I also want to thank Dr. Sundaram for working so hard with me in the MICU to get through this. And lastly, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Ronnie Bachner, who put a lot of stuff out on video about the challenges that we were all facing out in the community and the things that we needed to do to get through this. So I remember it was early March and we started getting sick visit calls from people who were coming off cruises saying that they were sick with fever and cough. And I remember on March 5th writing up a policy in our office saying we are not seeing any sick visits anymore. People were then screened. If they were sick, they were getting called in for antibiotics. They were not being brought into the office. Soon thereafter, we began a series of Zoom calls to try to figure out what we were going to do as a practice to try to get through this and what we were going to do to face these challenges. One of the things that people need to remember for those of us in the community who did telemedicine was that it was our job first and foremost to keep our chronic patients healthy, to keep them out of the hospital. If these patients did not get the care that they needed, these people would overwhelm what was going to already be an overwhelmed system. And we had to figure out the best way to do that. Also, as a group, we had to figure out what we could do to volunteer to help, and we really wanted to get in there and help. In addition to our commitment in the MICU on Team Silver, we worked at St. Peter's on COVID teams, and I even did a week as a hospitalist uh, for, the medical, for the medical service to give those doctors a break. But there were lots of other volunteers in the community that should be noted. A lot of the community pulmonary critical care doctors, Dr. Patlori DaCosta, Devonzo and Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Miramad worked on COVID teams at St. Peter's. And unfortunately, a number of them were infected, got better, and then went right back out there. In addition, our community hospitalists really worked hard to check chip in with patients who were unassigned because our medical school was overwhelmed with COVID patients. Lastly, our friends in ID care were instrumental in getting hospitals such as St. Peter's and Robert Wood Johnson Somerset organized and creations of COVID teams to keep those places from being overwhelmed as well. So getting back to my practice, Dr. Gilbert was in charge of finding all of our cleaning equipment and Dr. Hutt was in charge of finding as much PPE as he could find on the internet. At the time, we made a schedule up to prevent each other from seeing each other because we didn't want to get each other sick. Our commitment to the Mickey was very important to us and we did not want to get each other ill. Of course, that was blown out of the water after I got sick. However, we still found a way to avoid each other tremendously. Only one doctor in the office at a time, not seeing patients together, not rounding in the hospital together. These schedules are instrumental for us. What we needed to do in the office was to keep it running. We needed to keep open. We needed to not be able to close because as I said, our patients needed our care. So we were committed to keep our staff employed. Luckily, we were able to secure a PPP loan, which kept our employees with us. And again, as I said earlier, we ramped up our telemedicine visits. We were seeing upwards of 15 to 20 telemedicine visits a day, each of us. Thankfully, our EMR vendor was really, really good at helping us figure out how to negotiate our payers and what was going to be reimbursed to us. But also, we were using a platform such as Doxy.me and Doximity. So we were able to add video to nearly every single one of our visits, which was instrumental in making sure that we were doing okay. And as things went on, we sort of gotten into this pattern of working in the ICU, taking some time off to recharge, doing telemedicine. And as we got to March and into April, we got into this sort of rhythm of just going to keep going. We're going to keep going. constant Zoom meetings. Uh, to try to make sure that we were on the same page and we did everything to work with our friends in the hospital to keep working hard, keep offering opportunities to help. That was the next problem. Is right. Large offices actually stayed open throughout this. I don't know how they did, but a number of our internal medicine friends kept seeing patients kept swabbing patients. It wasn't just urgent carers who were keeping these people out of the hospital. These were internal medicine doctors, other specialists who braved their way through this. And I'm in awe of their ability to do so. But as we got close to things reopening, I must have spent hours working on all these policies and procedures to try to figure out a way that we could open our office. And we just opened our office this past Monday. We're having one physician a day working in the office. We're scheduling a 50% capacity. We have patients waiting in the car, not in the waiting room. We have ample PPE 
PPE to make sure that we are absolutely protecting ourselves as well as our patients and our staff. We are continuing to encourage social distancing in our patients, so much so even encouraging telemedicine visits, even now, even though we're off open, to try to make sure we keep these people off the streets and healthy. So what did we learn from this? We are not even close to being done. Things are going to continue to change. We're going to adapt to the times. We're going to off open slowly and safely, like a number of our states have done, but we're not going to open too quickly. Interestingly, we do PFTs in the office, and we're making people get nasal swabbed before then to make sure that they don't infect anybody else in our office, which is, of course, burdening our local urgent care, so we apologize. But most important to me, as a community doctor who has worked so hard in the MICU to create an environment where we can work together, the medical school and the community together can do great things. And I'm hopeful that the lesson learned, hopefully from both ends, is that there are people who want to help, that we can use all the people in this physician community to get through this. And in the end, it is believe, I believe that the volume of doctors and the quality of the doctors is one of the main reasons that Robert Wood Johnson did not get overwhelmed like so many other hospitals in the state because we were able to work together. I thank you for your time and I wish everyone good health and good luck. I want to thank everybody on our live stream this evening. We did get bit by the shift change bug, a little bit of a dip in the internet speeds as people finish up their charting and tack those time clocks that are IP based. But we do thank you for staying with us through this stream. Our final presenter tonight is Dr. Michael Steinberg, the Division Chief of General Internal Medicine and the Vice Chair of Research at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, have you stuck with us? I'm just going to uh, briefly wrap up the uh, presentations by talking about some of the research activities that have gone on here at Robert Johnson University Hospital and Rutgers Robert Johnson Medical School. So I'm going to go through just a sample of some of the research activities that um, we've that that were um, given birth to by this uh, pandemic. So you know, one of the things that we're very proud of is the research and scientific discovery that we have here at the medical school. And um, although I couldn't, I didn't in this time take um, too much time to go over every research study that uh, has been ongoing, um, I just wanted to give you a sample of some of the different studies that, that were, um, were uh, going on during this time. So first, um, we have the Rutgers Corona cohort. This is a cohort study that was um, conducted by some of our researchers in multiple divisions, um, Dr. Blazer, Dr. Carson, and Dr. Panateri. This was a, a prospective cohort study that was designed to characterize the factors related to viral transmission and disease severity in a large healthcare system. Um, it included a group of people that were followed over time, both healthcare workers as well as non-healthcare exposed community folks. Um, some of the goals included assessing the baseline prevalence of the uh, COVID-19 disease, characterize the natural history, um, to look at differences that, that may exist between uh, healthcare workers compared to non-healthcare workers, identify risk factors for acquiring this virus, and then determine the duration and extent of viral shedding. So just to kind of give you a, a snapshot here, this is the uh, cases of COVID-19 that were treated both at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital here in New Brunswick and University Hospital in Newark. And what you see are the two arrows at the bottom where the baseline visits occurred in this cohort study. So people were recruited into this study, uh, were tested, and followed over a period of time. So, you know, the idea here is to, is to look at a group of people before this uh, virus really entered into our, into our hospitals and then follow them over time and see how the virus um, advanced. So you see that initially the study was started at a point where there was very little, very few cases in our hospitals, and then uh, followed up at a point where we were just uh, approaching the peak. So just to kind of go over some of the brief um, preliminary results, and some of the studies that I'm going to present have, have results, and a lot of the studies I'm going to present are just um, in their uh, initiation stages. So in this study, what you see is the to total cohort included about 830 um, people, both healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers. You see in terms of the positive PCR tests, um, much higher rates in healthcare workers, about 12% versus about 1% in non-healthcare workers. In terms of positive antibody tests, again, 
just under 11% in healthcare workers and about 4% in non-healthcare workers. And going down to kind of total infected, which was defined as either a positive PCR test or positive antibody test. Again, 13.5% in healthcare workers versus about 5% in non-healthcare workers. And when we drill down a little bit more, looking at some of the uh, healthcare workers um, by site, I'll just point out, you know, this looked at the healthcare role, so attendings, residents, fellows, nurses, and then the unit where these workers were, um, were working. You see that um, I just highlighted a couple things that were somewhat different between the two uh, locations. So you can see in University Hospital in Newark, nurses had a significantly higher rate of, um, of exposure to disease, it's almost 18% um, versus about 6% at Robert Wood Johnson. If you go down to the units, not surprisingly, um, the emergency department was a place where there were relatively higher levels of disease. Um, on the medical floors, we saw that um, fairly high uh, in both places, just under 5%. You can see in the operating room um, at University Hospital in Newark, 14.8% of positive cases. And then in the designated uh, COVID-19 units, also relatively high levels of disease, uh, 11% in Newark and about 4% at Robert Johnson. So again, just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot, uh, some of the results here. I think a very interesting study and one of the largest cohort studies of healthcare workers in this pandemic um, that we've seen, uh, I think that's been developed. Um, another study that that same group uh, is, is in the process of, of performing is a screening study looking at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital employees. So the aim here was to screen 5,000 employees at, at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, both healthcare workers and other staff, as well as 1,200 um, medical staff for purposes of infection control, management of uh, person power, and assignments. And this started at the end of April and is, is still ongoing. Um, a questionnaire was completed that included your job description, where you work, exposure history, symptoms, et cetera. Um, testing included uh, viral testing by PCR, the ELISA test, um, and other samples were collected for further evaluation down the road, including serum studies and saliva studies. Um, and then, you know, we kind of followed people up. We, were, we asked people, they asked people um, if they could be followed up over time for future uh, studies and, and questionnaires. And again, just to give you a little snapshot of some preliminary results, um, about just under 3,000, this was as of uh, two weeks ago, just under 3,000 people signed consent and about 2,700 um, we have results for, they have results for so far. Interestingly, you see a, a fairly low rate of positive virus tests. So 0.3%, only eight people out of those 2,700 were positive for the virus. And just, just over 8% were positive for antibodies. So again, maybe a little reassuring in terms of hospital workers and uh, exposure in terms of active virus, um, this is maybe encouraging. So just a couple studies that are generated by a multidisciplinary group here at the medical school looking at our uh, healthcare workers' um, exposure. Again, just a couple um, studies from different divisions here at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Um, this is uh, out of our division of rheumatology with Naomi Schlesinger, who's the division chief. Um, it's a study to look at colchicine in terms of hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So we know that you've heard um, from a couple presentations today that immuno immunomodulation and Im anti-inflammatories um, in patients with COVID-19 may be um, useful, but the optimal treatment is yet to be defined. So the idea here is colchicine, um, which has some immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects, um, could be useful here. So this was a single, study, a single center study um, enrolling people between March and May of this year. Primary endpoint was all cause hospital, um, all cause in hospital death and follow up at 28 days. Um, there were 50 patients included in this study um, and the mean age was 58, 24% were female and they had some various chronic diseases. The findings included um, people who received colchicine were about twice as likely to be discharged from the hospital um, and the number of deaths that's the group receiving colchicine versus uh, the group who did not receive colchicine um, was significantly lower. So again, based on this small pilot study, it's interesting and it, it may uh, generate some hypotheses in terms of the role of colchicine as we continue to treat this disease in terms of uh, discharge from hospital and decreased mortality. 
Um, our Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care has been involved in many studies. Um, rather than give you uh, results, there were, there were too many studies to, to describe in detail, but just to give you an idea of the, the scope of the type of studies that uh, pulmonary critical care is involved with, um, strategies for diagnosis and biochemical characterization of COVID-19, Drs. Uh, Raddal, Jagpal, Panateri. Um, they're looking at different ways to look at, um, uh, to characterize this virus, um, PCR, using different media, uh, cellular proteomics, on certain filters and ventilators, um, looking at exhaled breath for certain organic chemicals, um, functional CT imaging in patients recovering with ARDS, uh, the Stop COVID multi center database study, looking at risk factors and treatment effects. Um, there were a number of clinical trials that were based, they were again multi divisional, but um, a study looking at tocilizumab for the treatment of uh, COVID 19, a hydroxychloroquine uh, clinical trial. Uh, treatment of mild to moderate ARDS, um, comparative efficacy, effectiveness, all strategies, patient satisfaction, as well as patient engagement and quality of life. Um, and then other studies, uh, N acetylcysteine and hospitalized smokers, and et cetera. So you see a wide variety of patients. This disease is primarily a pulmonary issue. That's where our hospitalized patients um, are most critically ill. So we can see a lot of research activity in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care. Um, and again, in general, a lot of opportunities to look at different clinical outcomes. So Dr. Parikh in general internal medicine, along with Dr. Glazer and a number of our trainees are involved in designing some uh, retrospective studies, looking at data from the hospital um, in terms of um, understanding predictors and severity of illness. An algorithm has been developed in terms of what kind of studies we should be using going forward and how to collect these data. The goal is to look at um, can we predict who might be more likely to have severity, uh, severe illnesses um, when the next wave of COVID-19 comes? So we're going to look at kind of metrics such as intubation, ICU transfer medications, and quality metrics such as mortality, length of stay, and readmission. Um, obviously, you didn't think I would get through a talk without talking about tobacco. So um, we're involved in, um, we're just about starting uh, to look at data here at patients discharged from Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. There's a lot of contradictory data in terms of the effect of tobacco use and COVID-19. Initially, we obviously thought that smoking is not good for uh, both, both the uh, risk of getting COVID-19 as well as the severity. And interestingly, the, the smoking rates among uh, early on in other countries, China and France, the smoking rates among hospitalized patients with COVID-19 were significantly lower than the general population. So there was thinking, could there be a protective effect of either smoking or nicotine? And that generated um, hypotheses about the influence of nicotine on um, ACE2 receptor level, et cetera. Um, so basically, we don't have a lot of good data. And one of the things we want to look at is a mixed method study of COVID-19 patients who are discharged to look at their tobacco, recorded tobacco use um, here in the hospital. And then, of course, during this time, how well and how accurate is that data? We're not so sure. So we're actually going to go back and um, ask people to uh, give a more detailed tobacco use history. So we can see if that tobacco use history uh, is linked to how they did clinically here in the hospital in terms of um, outcomes like ICU admission, intubation, et cetera, a need for home oxygenation. So again, a tobacco study coming uh, in the future. And I guess I'm just going to finish up by saying that um, practically every division here in uh, at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in the Department of Medicine was involved in research activity. And I think this really highlights the benefits of the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital being affiliated and being, um, you know, really the, the academic medical center um, here in, in New Jersey, in Central Jersey. Um, you can see that um, research studies done in the ID department by Dr. Bott, along with um, colleagues in pulmonary critical care, a remdesivir trial, which was, again, you've heard remdesivir being one of the promising medications in treatment of COVID-19. Um, you've heard from Dr. Philip just a little while ago, along with some of her colleagues um, in hematology doing uh, both convalescent sera trials as well as other uh, pharmaceutical trials. Dr. Rusty in GI, looking at GI manifestations of this disease. Dr. Leibowitz in nephrology, looking at could we um, mitigate some of the cytokine storm by extracorporeal filtration. And then a whole bunch of other studies that are still in the pipeline um, that, again, I've run out of time to talk about. So just want to give you the picture of 
lot of active research here at the medical school and at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. I'm very proud of these um, scientific discoveries. Good evening. Uh, remarkable presentations. Um, the, the research, the thought, the science that is going on here. Uh, thanks all our presenters uh, for what they've done this evening and for the hard work of the last few months. Uh, we think uh, very positively forward as we go forward and continue to learn, working together. We hope you've all enjoyed this evening. Once again, you, this will be replayed again through our website. You'll also be able to connect to you know, our, our uh, newsletter in order to get CME, and don't hesitate to reach out um, as, as we go forward. So uh, treat each other nice, learn from each other, work the problem, and we are RWJUH strong.